imposter syndrome or feeling like a fraud is a combination of external as well as internal factors. Regardless of gender, when expectations are set upon you and there are standards set upon you, you can be uh, marred with self-doubt. 70% of the population of the people working are affected by the imposter syndrome at some point in their life. It angers me that we use the term. At the end of it, it's male patriarchy at its best. Context is everything. Hi everyone and welcome to today's episode of Echelon's She Slays. We have three distinguished professionals here with us and we are going to get into the topic of slaying your imposter. We have with us today Shehara De Silva. Shehara is an inter international communication specialist and brand builder with over 30 years of experience in media marketing, strategic planning and advocacy both here and overseas. She holds senior level positions in private, multinational, government and development organizations with a focus on public-private partnerships, strategic social responsibility and gender equity. We have Yamuna Jairatna. Yamuna is the country head of marketing and strategy at Orem Holdings while also serving as a consultant covering investor relations and coverage for Trust Corp Advisory in Singapore. She was also the former director of sales and marketing for Port City Colombo. Last but not least, we have Shamin Tilakaratna, who is a partner and head of tax at Deloitte Sri Lanka. Shamin comes from a multidisciplinary background of accountancy and law, and she's been in the tax field for over 20 years. Ladies, welcome. Imposter syndrome. What causes these feelings of self-doubt? These feelings of, am I just in the right place at the right time? Um, do I just work harder than others? And why is this such a buzzword in the sense of, in the space of diversity, equity, and inclusion? So let's dive right into it, I think. Um, in preparation for today, I was watching this interview of uh, Indra Nui, um, former CEO of PepsiCo, where she says that uh, sometimes our environment makes us feel like imposters. If everyone is kind of talking over us, rolling our eyes when, when rolling their eyes when we speak, um, it gives us this feeling of, do I really belong here? What am I doing here? And she tells us not to forget that competence is the most important thing and to never forget that. Yamuna, I'll point this to you. Um, easier said than done, do you think? I think imposter syndrome or feeling like a fraud is a combination of external as well as internal factors, right? Uh, I know I... I, uh, it, it is something I had to struggle with uh, and, and possibly I still struggle with and work on every day. External factors, yes. Regardless of gender, when expectations are set upon you and there are standards set upon you, uh, you, you, you can be uh, marred with self-doubt, uh, self-questioning, a feeling of you're not good enough or am I doing the correct thing, questioning yourself continuously. Uh, and I think that comes from the environment that you're in. If your workplace does not encourage and support uh, and foster self-confidence in, in their employees, that can certainly contribute to this feeling of, uh, uh, feeling of being a fraud. Internal factors is, uh, and I think that's, that's very important, more so than the external factors, because I think there's, there's not much as an employee that you may be able to do towards the external factors. But what you can control are the internal factors. And I think once negative self, self image, and what I mean by self image is how you see yourself in your imagination right, when you think of yourself. Uh, so I think when we grow up and throughout our childhoods and in our careers, what we are born as our genuine selves. We are our genuine selves when we are children. But as you grow up, you are told not to do this, this is wrong, um, uh, you are this, you are that. So we get, we get covered in this external negative self-perception. And I think Shedding that negative self-perception is what takes work. And that's what uh, I have worked on as an individual uh, to try and beat the imposter syndrome. So 
that's that's my two cents on what I think. Uh, so I, I so I, I just to just to sum it up, I think it's a combination of external as well as internal factors. Got it. So building on from that, Charmin, do you think? What do you think? Where do you think all of this stems from? There is really no one reason or one cause for this imposter syndrome. But most often, let's say in an organization, uh, it stems from maybe uh, you not being represented in the leadership, right? So then you feel, okay, I'm not supposed to be here. I'm an imposter. And that could be across many issues. It could be gender-based. It could be <clears throat> ethnic minority representation. But essentially from you not being represented uh, in the leadership. It could also come from this, um, you know, you know my, myself being in a professional organization, from that need to be an expert all the time, to know your subject fully, 100%, all subjects. And then you feel that if you are somehow lacking in one area, uh, that again, you're an imposter and you shouldn't be here. So that... Um, feeling of want to be a hundred percent perfect especially in a in a in a culture or an environment where you're you know driven and it's result oriented you see this and i think and again i also was doing a little bit of reading and it's 70 percent of the population of the people working are affected by the imposter syndrome at some point in their life as you said you me everyone the idea is to you recognize the cause and like i said it can be many causes uh, not being represented, uh, the feeling of want to be perfect, high achieving. So all those, you recognize the cause, identify that and then see what you can do as the next step. Right. Got it. Shehara, imposter syndrome is such a strong word. It has this almost connotation of being fraudulent or like even a criminal kind of sense to it. We are in 2024 and we still term it this. Why do you think addressing this is so important when you look at meritocracy and inclusion in the workplace? Kumuzu, to a certain extent, it angers me that we use the term, right? Because I think it's a load of hogwash, right? At the end of it, it's male patriarchy at its best. Context is everything. And the very phrase imposter, right, is, is, is really bad for something that's universal. People, smart people... Uh, understand the limitations of, of their knowledge. And the smarter they are, they understand that there has to be some framework in which what they do. So, you know, how you cope and how you deliver. Uh, and smart people tend to also be perfectionists. And to that extent, again, uh, there is a need for smart people to adjust to and challenge themselves as to, am I really capable of this? Should I scope it a little bit? What is the practical reality and the context? But it has become a framing of women in particular or minorities where there are social and cultural context in which there has been a constant naysaying and so I feel it's a terrible put down. The fact that it's called a syndrome, as if it's a psychotic uh, illness, is ridiculous for, for what is really a very beneficial thing. And what angers me most is there's enough, enough of substantive research from leading organizations like the Harvard Business Review that says that women tend to... Um, the way we get feedback. So in any proper corporate, there is professional development and there would be assessments and sometimes there's negative feedback, which is a natural uh, process. So men tend to, in their, their typical egocentric, self-centered way, and this is broad stereotypes, there would be men who don't have it, they tend to take negative criticism and think, you know what? Oh, that's rubbish. I'm better than that. Let me show them. But if a woman gets negative uh, feedback, she tends to worry over it. She has sleepless nights. She, she, she tends to internalize it. And to that extent, I think HR and, and uh, human resources has not learned to layer and nuance its approach to women over men because we are built differently. We tend to have to juggle more different roles, which again puts uh, puts boundaries in terms how we cope. And on that is, you know, decades and decades of naysaying where people say women can't, you know, or women don't come to the table enough. So you carry that baggage with you, right? So you tend, therefore, to be told you lack self-confidence, come out there. As soon as you do, you're told what? That you're aggressive. 
we have we've just completed International Women's Day and we've moved into kind of like the gender part of this conversation. So, um, Shamin, one thing that again showed up in the research is that, you know, some ind individuals adopt this sense of um, kind of pessimism and, you know, that daring to believe in success will anyway end up in failure. So failure is a given. So let me not try. Um, and it says that this is mostly common among women, like we just spoke about. Um, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, so again, I mean, like just like Shara said, this uh, uh, imposter syndrome and then the fear of failure is something common to all. It, it affects all genders equally. But women, like you said, tend to internalize it more. The reason probably being that, I guess it's cultural also, how we've been, you know, sort of brought up over the years. Uh, women are tend to be allocated this specific role of, you know, homemaker, uh, stay at home sort of a role. And, and if you want to do something any different, um, that sort of makes you feel uh, like you're um, do taking on a role that you shouldn't be doing. And that gives that whole feeling of, you know, being an imposter. Which is, which is not the case, right? So again, it's, it's a little bit cultural based. It's how we've been brought up. It's how we've been take, how we've been taking roles over the years, even as a child. So that is the reason that women have that pessimism in them and they feel that anything they do, uh, they, they are set up to fail, but they are not. And, and that same fear of failure is there even among the men. And, and, um, you know, organization does, uh, a few of these training programs and uh, webinars and uh, talk shows on this imposter syndrome. And some of the, the male um, participants, they all admitted having the fear of failure was a big issue when you speak about imposter syndrome. So like I said, it affects everyone, but for females, because of their cultural role, what they've been in the past, it's, it's sort of, they internalize it. But I feel it's changing also uh, right now in, in as we go along, because now we have more access to social media, more research, more of these forums where these are discussed. So I feel like it's they're coming out of it. But yes, that that uh, tendency to internalize it is still there. On that note, Yamuna, what do you see as the pitfalls for workplaces and businesses is if women tend to give in to this imposter syndrome and they almost expect failure all the time? Yeah, I, I think massive pitfalls, Kumudu, uh, because one of the main features of imposter syndrome, or and I wouldn't generalize it to specifically just women, but employees in general, one of the features of the imposter syndrome is self-doubt. So you're not confident of your output. Uh, therefore, productivity would drop. The quality of the output that an employee puts in may drop because the person doesn't believe in himself or herself for that matter, right? So the productivity of an organization may suffer. As Shihara mentioned, women tend to internalize criticism uh, and the, the manner in which feedback is given may be more so. And as Shihara mentioned, uh, human resources of most companies are still not in tune to uh, to this sensitivity. So I think when it comes to um, equality within the organization, uh, women can get marginalized based on how feedback is given. So that is one of the other pitfalls for an organization. Uh, also in terms of fear of failure is a massive risk, especially if you have individuals that are in major leadership positions within the company. Fear of failure may drive these individuals to not take the right decisions or take risks that could drive the organization forward, right? So lack of clear decision making, uh, not taking accountability for one's decisions. And I've seen organizations that have gone through this with, and it's going to result in poor leadership, which is very detrimental towards an organization. So I think the pitfalls are many. Um, also, I think having this sort of environment within an organization can create a toxic work culture within the company. Because somebody who feels like a fraud or who has a fear of failure or fear of being found out, so to speak, um, may try to compete in a toxic manner 
with the rest of his team. It will impact teamwork negatively. It is not going to be a supportive environment. It will be a survival environment where employees are trying to survive. And in such an environment, there are so many other cultural toxic traits that can form within the company, which can be very difficult to stamp out. Um, so I think it's very important to create a culture within an organization that promotes open conversation, that provides feedback in a manner which helps an individual grow as an individual. So I think the pitfalls are many. Uh, I think the bottom line is, um, as Shehara said, I don't necessarily like using the word imposter, but creating a work culture where employees feel confident to bring their A game without fear is a culture that would work. If I can just add to what Yamuna says, because I think workplaces who are in the innovation space, or maybe not who imagine they're in the innovation space, sometimes do create mechanisms. Virtusa, which is not necessarily an innovative company, but they have because they're in technology. I remember there was a speech given once uh, by Chris Kanagaratna where he was saying one of the successes was that they wanted people to try new ideas, but there was always this thing about what if it fails, do you get penalized because you're wasting what company resources. But what they do is that they have a system by which even if you fail, because the code sometimes, that idea sometimes can be replicated in a different project, it's always tagged. And later, if it's used anywhere else, there is an incentive given to you. It allows people to try and try again because there is, there is one is an incentive scheme, uh, scheme. And then there are other cultures. Singapore is one where there is the word kiasu, which is kind of almost like a national thing of putting people down because they're super each, uh, achievers. But to a certain extent, they tend to also be scared of failure. So it's considered fear, a fear of failing. Uh, but the reverse of it is that the culture also applauds the try and try again and that there is something really noble in the idea of falling and trying, falling and trying. And I think inculcating that kind yes, of value yes, system yes. is very and important. And celebrating it in some way, yeah, yeah. And that is the true diversity and inclusion in a workplace Absolutely. where you, you know, value everyone's thoughts. And, and actually adding to your question, Kumudu, uh, you are actually underutilizing uh, when there are employees within a company uh, that feels uh, uh, like a fraud, you're actually underutilizing the total capacity of your employees. You're underutilizing the talent pool that you have because people are too scared to try anything new. And it actually uh, affects the organization performance and it it's does. a hidden cost, which some organizations don't realize because if you have a number of people at a certain layer yeah. operating with that thought process, yeah. I'm um, not supposed to be here and they have that pro thought process of I'll be found out, they'll be very risk averse and they'll not, um, you know, uh, take any... Uh, exciting decisions or or have any entrepreneurial uh, or ideas yeah initiatives exactly and there there is a hidden cost for the organization which will translate in the long run to a financial loss so i think organizations also are recognizing this and that is why like i said in my organization they have these platforms where we can discuss these issues speak out and you know just give them that comfort that they're not alone in this journey and actually shaman people will feel demotivated um, and that is going to 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 end to turn out with with people leaving the organization. So there's certainly the, the direct link to to what you just said. Also, sometimes I mean, what happens is people stop wanting to give suggestions mm -hmm. because you're told don't rock the boat, right? Don't rock the boat is a constant thing. So either you create mavericks or contrarians or people who once in a while will challenge the system. So should we uh, stop telling women about imposter syndrome and kind of like labeling it and getting it, you know, out there or what? what is the, any thoughts around that? It's important that it's discussed. And within an organization, I think it's also important that um, leaders are not afraid to show vulnerability. 
you know, um, because everyone looks up to the leader. And if the leader can uh, give the others the assurance that, you know, uh, nothing is perfect and everybody can make mistakes, there'll be those who are not afraid to reach out. And at a senior level, again, just like Yamuna said, even you and I, we go through that uh, thought process at some point. Am I, am I here because I deserve it? Uh, it's good to value other people. At a senior level, you tend to forget to uh, value the senior uh, employees because you think, okay, they've, they've come here because they've achieved it, so they should know they are good. Uh, but human nature is such that you need that validation. So that value is needed. Uh, need of the, and the, the fact that the leaders are open to discuss and are vulnerable themselves, and they dis show that, not just, you know, uh, have structured training programs, but actually demonstrate that, that I think um, would go towards helping this whole coping, this one syndrome. Okay. Yeah. I, so, would, actually, I would very strongly say we should never use the phrase, we shouldn't. Uh, and there are many other ways of framing it. You know, it I could agree be, with Shahar you know, on that. Charge up, ego, anything you want, right? To pump people up from a positive way. Uh, and uh, humility is also a good thing. Uh, risk mitigation by assessing your capabilities is a good thing. So self-doubt is quite, can be an energizing factor, right? Because then you, you pull yourself up on the bootstraps and you, you move on. So criminalizing it as calling it a syndrome and, and a <laughs> disease and then an imposter, especially in this day and age, I think is is a very, very wrong term to use and we should just throw it out. I agree with <laughs> Shehar on that uh, because I think at various points in their careers uh, struggle with it. And I think it's, it's, it's a question of um, confidence it's a question it's, it's also humility to, to some extent as well it's questioning am i good enough do i need to do better well, what's it's, wrong it's, with it's, that? what's wrong with that? Yeah. i mean there's nothing necessarily wrong with that it is it is it becomes an issue if it's keeping you back from what you should be doing but it is about creating environment where you are able to cross that bridge within an organization Shaman, you mentioned earlier that, you know, when you're at senior levels, you tend to think about this, you tend to think less about senior people feeling this and the whole vulnerability thing. But when you were younger, at an early age, did you question your value or self-worth? And, you know, what do you think it's like for younger people today coming into the workforce? I mean, like I said, in all stages of my life, I've gone through this, even as a student, uh, as I took on uh, leadership roles in school and, and then post-school and so on. Um, but uh, as a child, there you have, a, a, or as a younger person, you have a bigger danger of this actually uh, turning into a syndrome uh, rather than just having that feeling. Uh, because if it goes unchecked, there is the danger that it can, um, you know, shut you down completely. Uh, and that is why you need positive roles around you, mentoring, constant mentoring, even as a child in school, uh, maybe guidance counselors who can um, sort of just let you know that it's just okay to feel scared sometimes, but you need to move past it. And that's something that you will experience throughout your life. And then the important thing is not to give into it. So yeah, we have, to make, we have to make sure this thing doesn't become a syndrome. We should stop it before it gets to the stage where it's a syndrome. So on that, Yamuna, um, has your opinion of your self-worth changed over the years from when you first joined the workforce? Was it a gradual change? Was it easy? With the varying rules that I have taken throughout my career, uh, Kumudu, uh, I have to say it comes and goes. Um, of course, uh, my sense of self-worth or my negative uh, self-image, um, so to speak, uh, is something I had to work very hard uh, to actually eradicate. Um, and it takes work. And when I say it takes work, um, just like you, you go to a gym to, to build your physique, I think working on your mind and your thought processes, because what you think, your thoughts become you. I mean, that's what I firmly believe. Um, and your actions, your behavior, who you are, even your personality is determined by what you think and what you do every day. And that becomes a habit, a practice, and then your personality. So working on your mind is something that I, that I practice every day. So um, 
contributing towards eradicating self-doubt, taking up challenges and challenging myself is something I do constantly. Depending on the roles that I take, yes, some are challenging, some are, and, and more challenging it is, the better it is for me. So this syndrome that was conceptualized in the 80s now almost has this following with TED Talks and books and things like that, self-help books almost. Um, and we spoke a little bit about childhood and, you know, it could be the validation that we didn't get uh, earlier on in life. It could be that we have got too much validation from parents and then life happens and suddenly there, there is all of this doubt. Um, Shahara, as a mom, as a mentor, what can we, what more can we do to kind of end this cycle and how do we address these things, especially when it comes to the workplace and how we get there? Yeah, so I think those of us who, who've had role models in our life, you know, powerful women, you know, as parents or aunts or uncles or grandmoms or, or anyone in society who stood out and we've, we've wanted to emulate, has been a very powerful figure. So as you go down social hierarchies and things like that, there may be less of it. So if you look at slightly more marginalized communities like in Sri Lanka, you might look at the plantation workers or things like that. The lack of role models is significant. So wherever possible, understanding where people come from and understanding that diversity in, in its totality, even economic challenges, all these can layer people's response and their confidence levels. Uh, that's, that's one area I think that we should work on. The other area that I think is systemic is that we, uh, we women tend uh, not to network as much as men do. It's, it's sort of a cultural thing again, which may be also that we value our time and maybe, you know, we wish to go and then at least muck around with friends or, you know, with our kids and family. But we may not want to just go and have a boozy night with the office colleagues. We've had enough of them. We want to, you know, so that's problematic. It could be. And, and again, there is a need to say, how do you work around it? Uh, and and uh, try and find methodologies there. But I think the constant repeating of, you know, the yes, we kind, the yes, we can kind of mantra wherever we go is very important to dwell on what our potentiality is and uh, not necessarily focusing on all the challenges we face because that sometimes tends to accentuate the fact that, you know, yes, we have challenges, we are more complex because of society's emphasis that usually the woman plays the role in terms of the homemaker and the, uh, you know, the person, the glue in the family. Uh, and that's a reality in most cases. But uh, to if we keep dwelling on that, sometimes uh, I think we've got to keep that in place, but in public forums, sometimes whinge less about it and use our, you know, use our support network of other women and things to bitch about all these things. <laughs> Yamuna, I think Shamin spoke a bit about this earlier. Is do you think slaying your imposter is harder as you go up the career ladder? Because you tend to, th you get more responsibilities, you're, you have more accountability, this need to constantly bring in your A game all the time because you're being watched. I think um, contrary to what people might think, you're, you're on top, you look confident and it's not as challenging anymore. Um, but that's not necessarily always true because um, uh, as you go up the corporate ladder and you're in more visible positions, there are more eyes on you uh, and the stakes are higher. The mistakes you do or the failures that you may, uh, that, that may take place, the stakes are higher for many people, not just for yourself. Um, so there's more weight on the decisions you make. There's more visibility upon you. There's more accountability upon you. Uh, therefore, uh, the level of anxiety or worry or responsibility upon your shoulders may be more, uh, which may give rise uh, to this feeling of, of am, I, am I good enough? Um, but I think consistently working on oneself and trusting oneself and trusting your decision making uh, is important in this process as you go up. 
Um, and also, I think the higher you go, it, you get a little bit more isolated. Uh, I mean, they say it's lonely at the top, and that is a fact. There's not a lot of people you might be within an organization, for example, that you may be able to casually uh, have a conversation with about your fears and worries and whether you're good enough. And also, when you're in a strong leadership role, you may not want to appear weak or unsure of yourself among your team members or those who look up to you to take the right decisions on their behalf. Um, so these are concerns I think uh, one might have in a leadership role as you go up the hierarchy. But I think it's important to understand that every, every, every person, regardless of the power they hold or the designations they hold, is a human being at the end of the day. So recognizing that fact, uh, forgiving yourself, uh, being a little bit more kind to yourself uh, are all, all things that I personally adapt uh, to sort of uh, cope with uh, any high pressure Jerry, situations. You also spoke about coping mechanisms earlier. Any particular things that you have find, found useful in this journey? Right. I mean, I wasn't conscious of it initially, but I have two little anecdotes I'd like to tell you. I used to do a kind of uh, a mentoring, uh, preachy kind of sessions with my teens. Uh, and one of them was about the mirror of disquiet. And now I realize that in a way, it was flipping this whole idea of self-doubt. Uh, I didn't, I wasn't conscious of it, but I was using it more like to say, you know, when you get up in the morning and you put your tie on or you wear your sari or your dress, why don't you look yourself in the mirror and ask yourself, are you the best version of yourself? Mm -hmm. Could I do better? But more to egg them on, right? But I did use the word mirror of disquiet there as a sort of poetic metaphor, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and also about trying to give them purpose in terms of, you know, do it, don't just do it because out of road, don't get up in a lazy way yeah. because you have to clock in, try and find something. So that was one area. But I think increasingly as I found that I was kind of, you know, in most cases I tended to be in my generation, I tended to be one of the first in most of the roles I played, right? So you go into your first board meeting and someone says, I'd like to welcome Shahara as the first lady onto this board and we hope she brings in some color. Right, <laughs> And there I look and then I have this sort of out of body thing of realizing I'm in some violently colorful sari and everybody else is just like an undertaker, right? So humor suddenly, you know, I didn't get insulted, I didn't get right. angry particularly. And uh, that has become, I guess, a kind of hallmark of my leadership style, even with my teams, where I've exaggerated to some extent and been ex somewhat eccentric <laughs> uh, because I found it easier. Then I wasn't that hardcore kind of pushy, ballsy woman. I was more the eccentric and people started liking me more for it. So I was being manipulative, perhaps, in, in using humor, easier, pretending to be a little more chaotic than I was because then it made people, you know, at the end of it, they had something to laugh about while I was pushing them to do something. Yeah. Uh, and the other area was quite often also, you know, making the girls feel that they had a support because sometimes we women leaders don't do enough about that. And in, in, a, in a Sri Lankan context, I used to uh, I guess uh, people will understand the Totta Baba syndrome about the Asian male, mm -hmm. you know, that mothers and all have weakened them. And that thank God for the millennials, because to a certain extent, the millennials, the women are very much, I think, ahead. All the research is showing that the girls are out beating the men and the men are becoming weaker and weaker with years and years of privilege. Uh, they are weakening and the women are becoming. So, you know, there is data to show that one day, at least finally, uh, we will take over and run this world, I think, a damn sight better than the men now. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, she had adding to what yeah. you're saying. Um, I mean, even in my career, what I faced, you don't need to be like a man to be successful in your career. Yeah. I've, uh, I embrace femininity in all its forms uh, without having to be, as you said, this ballsy woman, yeah. which, is, which is something I'm <laughs> certainly not. Yeah. So I agree with you on that uh, very much. And also one of the things I used to do with uh, my teams uh, just to build their confidence is visualize yourself where you want to be as this successful, imagine it, put color into it. 
but don't look at it from a third person's perspective. Get into the shoes of what you're imagining. See it through yourself in your most successful self. I'd like to share uh, one coping mechanism that I've used and I've not really uh, realized that it is uh, an actual coping mechanism for this syndrome and I found that out uh, leading up to this discussion and I had a look at some videos. So one thing I do do is uh, I actively seek out someone I admire, uh, maybe, a, maybe my peer or, or someone you know, in the leadership role. I look for something that they are weak in. And, and almost always you can find something that they're not good at in them. And that helps me understand that, okay, uh, everyone has something with them, with, they're not perfect. And that doesn't mean they're an imposter because they're there. And you admire the person because you know that they're not an imposter. So, and they've come to a certain role in life. So it's, it's good to, uh, when you doubt yourself, actively seek out someone you admire, find out the similarities you have with that person and also their weak points and see, and you may find that you don't have those weak points. Based on those weak points, you are actually a better person. So it gives you that inner confidence. Okay, it, it, it's not a, a disaster to doubt yourself, uh, you just need to work harder. And, and Michelle Obama herself had said that she has gone through that feeling of being an imposter. And when she was asked how she coped with it, she said, well, I worked harder at what I had to do. So being prepared, I mean, those are all the things you can do to overcome this. But uh, try to seek out that one person you admire and see where they are weak and then see, okay, you know, you're not too bad yourself. Interesting. So any final thoughts before we wrap up is self-doubt alone battle for the most part or are we in this together i don't think it's a lone battle uh, like i uh, and and like shara said we shouldn't like uh, call it that syndrome it sort of gives that uh, ugly tag to it clinical clinical term yeah <laughs> And as I said, uh, research has shown that more than 70% of the people are affected, including males. It's just that males are more uh, silent about it and they don't speak about it. Just be aware of it. Don't, you know, internalize it, but know when to reach out to help for help and don't let it sort of push you over the edge. I'd say that uh, if you are someone who tends to Perhaps they say there are techniques like perfectionism, procrastination, various things that play out when you have self-doubt, okay? If you recognize it within yourself or within others, you have to have something counterintuitive to that in, in some way or, or the other and, and look for ways in which you spot it in, 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 a, in an office in terms of the group mechanisms that play out, everything. So quite often finding modules which involve either play or, or some other form of, uh, so gameplay is quite a good way in terms of, you know, breaking down certain kind of hard set ways of looking at it, right? Uh, because then your defenses are down in a different way. Uh, and in, in sport, quite often women, women tend to then play by those rules and don't say, I'm not going to win this. I'm going to try and win it, right? And use those metaphors into, into a workspace. But it, it is sad because it prevails all, all over, you know, in all sorts of forms. And I'd like to quickly tell you a story because I've just come down from Australia and I think I casually mentioned yeah. it because I think at its most brutal sense, this is a story. It's hitting the headlines all over in Australia about Australia's so-called serial killer. She was vilified. She was a young mum. And she lost three of her children or something like that in what were caught deaths or something like that. And then they found a diary in which she had self-doubt, huge self-doubt about her motherhood. Was I a good mother? I shouldn't have scolded the kids so much. I, you know, I was criminal. I'm at fault. Everything. They used the diary to lock her away for a long, long period before finally there was some research to show that there was a genetic predisposition both in her husband and her in, in possibly the children having died of actual physiological causes. And then the narrative broke out in terms of women typically, whether it's in mothering, whether it's as a wife, whether it is, I don't know if you are, you know, the wife of a diplomat or a 
whatever it is, in many roles we play, we sometimes are far too harsh with ourselves, right? And society too, where they frame it like that, they're judging you related to all this. What is she doing at work all this time when she should be with the kids? You know, the kids are running wild. If you're at home, they say, oh, you know, she's not contributing to the economy. It's a no-win situation. So somewhere in this whole thing, I think we have to sort of, you know, kind of lean into this whole thing and, and keep fighting the system and says, you know what, you guys, why don't you just take a hike? Yeah? <laughs> Go and find something really worthwhile to talk about and leave us alone. <laughs> Any final thoughts, Yamuna? When I think of this entire discussion and, and the wonderful things we've talked about, um, one thing that comes through is kindness to oneself. And the visual that comes to my mind is this Japanese art of mending broken ceramics with gold. And you come up with this beautiful, unique piece of art. And I think a human being is like that. No one's perfect. Uh, whether you're a man, woman, whatever. But as Shihara said, yes, there are societal expectations and multiple roles that women play, uh, which makes it more so um, challenging for women. Uh, but I think um, being kinder to ourselves and celebrating the fact, and when I say celebrating, I mean honoring and celebrating the fact that although we are all flawed as individuals, coming out of it and achieving something great in our own way, whatever achievement it may be, it should be celebrated. Flaws and all. So. <laughs> well, thank you to all our speakers today for a fantastic discussion. And we hope our audience was able to pick some uh, key insights from it as well. Thank you for watching. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. <laughs>